Hello. In a moment you will hear a practical message from God's Word by Dr. Charles A. Stewart, pastor of Cana Baptist Church of Burleson, Texas. If you are not in your automobile, I encourage you to have your Bible, pen, and pad in hand as you enter into this life-changing study of God's Word. I will return with some concluding comments following our pastor's message. Hey, amen. Did you notice a candle this morning? Amen. <clears throat> if you are a guest with us, uh, 127 weeks ago, we began asking the Lord if it would please and honor him to allow somebody in our church to lead one soul to Jesus each week. And for his glory, he's led us as a church, our members, to see 487 people come to Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, this candle represents God's mercies to a young woman in Thailand whose name is Meow. And uh, we have a church member in Thailand right now, and he and a friend of his and a translator went out witnessing in Thailand and they were at a university and they noticed a couple of young university students, female students sitting on a bench and they went over to them and they said, may we discuss with you the relationship between Christianity and Buddhism because most people in Thailand are Buddhist. And the two young ladies said, sure. So through the translator, they began discussing Buddhism and Christianity. Well, one of the young women kind of lost interest in the conversation and she got up and she left. But Mayow stayed. And during the conversation, Mayow admitted that she had spent some time in a Christian school in Thailand and that a friend of hers at that school had given her a Bible. But while she was a practicing Buddhist and was seeking peace through Buddhism, she admitted that it was when she read the Bible that she had more peace in her life. The translator shared with Mayow how she had come out of Buddhism into Christianity herself. And then our church member asked Mayow, would you like to experience peace with God through his son, Jesus Christ? And Mayow said yes. And she received Jesus as her Lord and Savior. Amen. <clears throat> <laughs> Amen. Well, let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for this Cana member who is seeking to share you in Thailand. And Father, we pray you'll bless him and those who are in his group as they are going out seeking to share Jesus with a lost and dying nation. And Father, we pray that they will return from Thailand with many wonderful testimonies of your grace and mercy in the lives of the people of Thailand. And Father, once again, we thank you for answering many prayers that if it would please and honor you, that you would allow someone in our church to lead a soul to Jesus. So we find ourselves here at the threshold of week 128. And Father, we ask again, if it would please you, if it would bring you honor to allow someone in this worship hour to have the joy of introducing a soul to Jesus, we ask you to let that happen. Father, we give this coming week into your hands. And Lord, I pray that as the seed of the gospel is sown, that it will not return void, but it would accomplish what you desire whereunto you send it. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be ambassadors of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. I do want to tell you about uh, a situation that Becky and I had uh, Thursday night. Uh, Macy's was having a luggage sale, and we would just worn out our luggage and decided we would go look at their luggage and a lady came and said I'm Vicki may I help you I'm the luggage specialist well we don't know a lot about luggage I'll just be honest with you but uh, Vicki was very very helpful to us and I would say Vicki probably was in her late 50s 
And uh, I'm thinking, Lord, I'd like to share the gospel with Vicki. Would you give me an opportunity, but show me how to get into the gospel? So we were paying Vicki for our uh, luggage. And I uh, got one of my uh, Romans 6, 23 uh, little cards in my hand. And Becky was signing for the luggage. And I'm thinking, all right, Lord, how do I get into the gospel? So when Vicky was tying things, loose ends together, I said, Vicky, you know my name because she had seen it on the credit card. But I said, you don't know what I do. I said, I'm a pastor. And I said, I like people and I like to be a blessing in the lives of people who have been a blessing in my life. And I said, Vicki, we're going to enjoy this luggage the next time we take a trip and hopefully many trips in the future. But let me ask you a question, Vicki. Are you ready for the big trip? She kind of looked at me. And then it hit her what this pastor meant when I said the big trip. And she said, oh, uh, no, I don't think I am. I said, Vicki, I can share with you how you can be ready for the big trip and know when you die that you are for sure going to spend forever with God in heaven and with his son, Jesus. I've got a little card here. May I share this with you? And then she started backpedaling on me. All right. And there were other people in the store and it was obvious she did not want to discuss this right then and there. So I knew what to do. I got Vicky in a headlock and I said, no, you will listen to me. Do you believe that? No, I didn't do that. You know, I didn't. I said, well, Vicky, I'm sorry that that I don't have the opportunity to share with you. But if you would accept this little card, it explains how you can know for sure that you're going to go to heaven when you die. And then you'll be ready for the big trip. Folks, sharing Jesus is a way of life. I can whip out my wallet and show you my grandkids quicker than you can count to a hundred by tens. All right. I'm experienced at that. Why won't I share Jesus with others? He means more to me than my grandkids. Why won't I talk to others about Jesus? It should be a natural thing. So I just encourage you. You're planting seeds. I encourage you to continue doing that. When we get to heaven after the long journey, we're going to find out a lot of people came to Jesus because you were faithful to share the gospel and to share gospel tracts. Amen. Amen. Shattering the darkness. This is, is just great commission. That's all it is. And that's who we are as Christians. So don't lose heart. Keep sharing. All right. Now, how many of you are studying the book of Job in your Sunday school class? Could I see a hand? Lift it up high. Well, all right. Most people in the early service in their Sunday school classes are studying the book of Job. And Job is a great book filled with many wonderful life lessons. But one of the things Job teaches us is that life can take unexpected turns very quickly and you can find yourself in a situation for which you find yourself ill equipped, unprepared. And in that moment, you need the assurance that you can get God's attention when you want to pray and say a quick prayer or when you find yourself in uh, life's adversities or trials like Job did. It sure helps you to get through that trial when you know that you have the undivided and focused attention of Almighty God at that moment of your need. This summer, we're looking at some of the great promises in the Bible. And some of these promises are absolutely extraordinary. And this is one of those promises today. Would you open your Bibles, please, with me to Isaiah chapter 66. Isaiah chapter 66, and I'll be reading out of a New King James Version this morning, if mine is a little different from yours. Isaiah 66, verse 1, and when we get to verse 2, you're going to see an amazing promise of God, of God's attentiveness. And that's what we want to know we have in life's the most difficult moments. Isaiah chapter 66, verse 1. Thus says Yahweh, the Lord, 
Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build for me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things my hand has made and all those things exist, says the Lord. But on this one will I look on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. Thank you. You may be seated. When you find yourself in a difficult spot, you want to have the assurance in your heart and mind that when you get on your face before God, you have his loving, caring concern, his undivided attention upon you in that moment of adversity. Now, before we look at Isaiah 66, verse two, I discovered when I was reading the larger context of this promise, two more passages in Isaiah that really are helpful to us understanding Isaiah 66, 2, and what God has in mind when he says, this is the one to whom I will look. So let's look, first of all, at Isaiah 64, verses 4 and 5. You follow along with me as I read on the screen. Since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by their ear, nor has their eye seen any God beside you who acts for the one who waits for him to act means God moves in behalf of a certain kind of individual. What kind of individual does God move in behalf of the person who waits for him? What does it mean to wait on the Lord? It means that you're standing in faith in an hour of need and you're trusting God according to his promise, according to his word to come through in your behalf. Waiting on the Lord is an expression of faith. I know that I get very impatient when I am in a moment of need or a moment of crisis, but waiting on the Lord means I allow God to move in accordance with his perfect timing. So God wants to act in behalf of those who trust him. He goes on. You, speaking of the Lord, meet him who rejoices and does righteousness, who remembers you in your ways. What does it mean for God to meet you? It means he encounters you and you know his presence. Folks, I can go through hell if I know God is with me. And so can you. So God says, I will meet him. I will walk with her. I will commune and fellowship with that person. Who does what? Who loves and rejoices in righteousness. So a person who loves righteousness and acts righteously, that's the person God will walk with in communion and in fellowship. But notice also the person who does righteousness also remembers the Lord. That means they're acknowledging the Lord in all of their ways. Like Proverbs 3, 5 and 6, acknowledge the Lord in all of your ways and he will direct your paths. So the person who remembers the Lord is the person who brings God into the experiences of their daily life. I'll tell you one of the ways you remember the Lord when you're uh, having a meal and you say grace before a meal. I know many of you, uh, like Becky and I, will be out in public sometimes. You'll be having a meal and you'll say grace. You just bow your head around the table and you say a blessing. Becky and I did that at a Panera's in Birmingham on our way back from Georgia on vacation. And uh, I noticed as we were finishing our meal, there was another table not too far from us. Everybody bowed their head before they ate. They didn't know me. I didn't know them. But when I was walking out of Panera's, I walked by their table and said, thank you all for your witness for Christ. Just walked right on. People notice that you're remembering the Lord. And it says something when you're in a crisis, you remember the Lord. All right. Acknowledge the Lord in all of your ways. When you want to make a decision, you want to do so in a way that honors God. That's remembering God. God says, I want to meet and I want to walk with that person and I want to act in their behalf. All right. Then there was another passage in Isaiah 57 that I think helps us to understand 
a little bit Isaiah 66 too. Follow along with me as I read there, please. Isaiah 57, 15. For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place and also with him who is of a contrite and humble spirit to nourish the spirit of the humble and to refresh the heart of the contrite. Have you ever been in a crisis that goes on just long enough where you find yourself emotionally empty? Physically depleted. Yeah, I'm sure you've been there. Well, notice what God says. He says, I dwell in heaven above, but I also dwell with that person who is humble and of a contrite spirit. That's the same thing as meeting that person. God wants to dwell with you. God wants you to know his presence in your daily life. And notice also, he wants to nourish and to refresh us when we're going through trials, when we're going through difficult times, when we're running on emotional, spiritual and physical empty. But to whom does he provide this refreshing and nourishment to the one who is contrite and humble of spirit? That really ties us back in to Isaiah 62. So. God really is serious about doing something. He's not just a looker. He's a doer. All right. He has an interest in you and in your life. All right. Now, as we're going through this series on the promises of God this summer, I'm trying to help you to learn that when you come to a promise and you want to claim that promise, the first thing you need to do is check the context in which that promise is found. Because there are many promises in the Bible that are not for you and me personally. They were for King David or for Moses or for somebody else in the Bible. But there are many promises in the Bible that are for the children of God in general, in every day and in every age and in every generation and in every circumstance. All right. So we need to check the context of the promise. So as I look at Isaiah chapter 66, verse two, I noticed in back in chapter 64, Isaiah, who's ministering to the northern ten tribes called Israel. He is lamenting Israel's unfaithfulness to God. He is talking about their sins. He is grieved over the sins of the nation of Israel. And then in chapter 65, he's talking about Israel being a divided nation. Folks, do you not think that America is divided today? Becky and I were talking over uh, the, the uh, breakfast the other day, and we were noting that back in the 1960s, after we graduated from high school, the counterculture, and they were called this, the counterculture culture was the love revolution. Free love. No restraints. They were called the counterculture. Do you know who the counterculture is today in America? Us. Those of us who said, no, sexual relations are God's gift to a husband and a wife. God says this is to be reserved for the marriage covenant. Now we're the counterculture. Things have really flipped on us here. We're a divided nation. By the way, God's people have typically been the minority. Always God works through the righteous remnant. But we are a divided nation. Israel was a divided nation. And the, the numbers of those who were unrighteous and living in rebellion and in sin was mounting greatly. And the righteous were grieved over the direction of the nation. And Isaiah warns. The people of Israel, God is going to bring discipline. He's going to bring judgment. And you know what happens to the righteous when God judges a nation? They suffer right along with the unrighteous. We do suffer. And Isaiah's warning the people of God as well as the ungodly. There is a time of discipline and suffering at hand. And then in chapter 66, he's contrasting the true worshipers and the false worshipers of Yahweh, the God of Israel. And in verse two of chapter 66, he's talking about the true worshipers of God, those to whom God looks. All right. So as I look at the context, honestly, I don't see anything that would limit this promise 
to that generation and that generation alone. I believe that Isaiah 66, 2 is as relevant to you and me today as we go through a time of difficulty personally, as we are about to go through a time of difficulty in our nation. I am forewarning you troubled times lie ahead for America. And as we go with our nation, whom we love greatly, as we go with America through very difficult and troubled times, we need to be able to claim Isaiah 66 too. By the way, I'm not the only pastor who's saying God is calling to America. He's using all kind of financial uh, crises, natural disasters. He is using all measures at his disposal to call America to repentance. First of all, his people then the nation. So we need to listen up. And we're going to find Isaiah 66 too more and more relevant, I predict, with each passing day in American life. So what about the relevance of this promise? Where might this promise be relevant in your life or in mine? Well, I've already mentioned as our nation goes through divine discipline, God lovingly calling America back to himself, we can expect to suffer. The same financial crises that the nation suffers, the same um, natural disasters that uh, I believe he has unleashed upon our nation. But Isaiah gives us some clues as well. Isaiah predicts in 66, 5 that the righteous will be persecuted by the unrighteous. I had a uh, church member come up to me right after the first service, and he said, I just want you to know uh, Cain is on the radar screen in Washington. I said, uh, what do you mean? He said, well, I have a congressman, somebody who works in a congressman's office. They're a personal friend of mine. I called him up this week, said, I'm sorry, I haven't been uh, communicating with you lately. How are your parents doing and so on and so forth? And I told him what our church had done about severing ties with uh, our Boy Scout uh, PAC 620 and why we did that, why we felt it was a sad day in the life of our church and we didn't feel we had a choice in this matter that Boy Scouts had left us. And he said that the friend in Washington, D.C. told him, he said, well, it's just a matter of time before this administration begins putting pressure on your church. You just just watch. It's going to happen all across America. It'll be very uh, subtle at first, but the pressure will continue. I believe the righteous will be persecuted. And folks, when you're hurting because people in the office are persecuting you, people at school are persecuting you, you're being ridiculed for your faith. Isaiah 66, 2 is a promise you need to be able to claim. Also, in Isaiah 66, 6, when God brings judgment on a nation, I've already referred to that. We need to know that we have God's loving care and undivided attention upon us and those we care about most. And then in Isaiah 66, 1, Whenever a child of God earnestly desires God's favor and the assurance of his attention, you can be going through a health crisis, a financial crisis, a marriage crisis, a crisis with your family. You can be going through any kind of crisis. And in that crisis, it will sustain, nourish and refresh your spirit to be able to stand on Isaiah 66, 2. This is the one to whom I will look, to the one who is humble, contrite of spirit, and who trembles at my word. That's the promise you and I want to be able to claim. All right? Now, there's a very interesting word there. God says in the promise, I will look. This is the one to whom I will look. Now, I thought, okay, this is critically important. I need to know what God means when he says, this is the one to whom I will look. Uh, a bunch of you teenage guys go to the mall and you are looking at the uh, ladies as they go by, you know. And that's just a casual glance. That's not what God's talking about here. Uh, right now, you may be looking at me. You may not be looking at me. But you might be looking at me. He's not talking about that either. I'm teaching. You're looking at me, you're looking at the screen, going back and forth, looking around the church. That's not what he's talking about here either. This word to look has a very specific meaning in the Old Testament. And it's not used a lot of times, but it doesn't show up just once or twice either. This word to look means to regard, to esteem another person. 
when Rob White was uh, dating um, Melissa Tadson, he looked and he looked and he started looking and he liked what he saw. And as he got to know Melissa, his gaze became more intense. Rob, you're you're blushing back there. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. A little bit anyway. And uh, he began seeing qualities in her life that really attracted him. She began to find esteem and regard in his sight. She was not just some other young woman that he might have been interested in or might have dated. There came a point at which she had such esteem in his eyes that he began to think, could this be a relationship for a lifetime? Could God be calling us? To join our lives in His service? I'm trying to keep it spiritual, okay? But she became more and more of high esteem and regard in His sight. And He began looking at her more and more. She, he began, began to very carefully, with great focus and su- sustained attention, to contemplate her in a favorable light. And eventually... He asked her to marry him. And we're all glad she said yes. All right. Now, this word to look. Carries that kind of connotation. It is a sustained, careful, focused, favorable contemplation. When God looks at someone, he looks upon this person with favor. Kind of like grandparents looking into the bassinet of a newborn baby. They kind of like that. I get more excited for grandparents than for parents now, being one of the grandparents. But they look with favor. They look at their grandkids with favor. They love to study them. They are so fascinating. How come our kids weren't this fascinating? You know? They are fascinating to watch. Seeing them develop and grow, it's just absolutely incredible. Well, it's that kind of careful, focused, sustained attention that God wants to give you. Yes. And you say, I don't know that that's possible. I'm one among five billion people. Well, notice again the context of this promise. Before God says, this is the one to whom I will give my sustained, focused esteemed regard. He says, heaven is my throne. What's he talking about? He's talking about the universe that we can see and the spiritual realm beyond that. God says, that's my throne. I rule over all of the universes, over all realms of creation. I am the sovereign God. And by the way, that speck of sand in the universe that you call earth, it's just my footstool. Just a speck of sand, but I reign there too. And I am the one who can give an individual on that speck of sand in the entire universe over which I reign, I can give that individual my undivided, sustained, and regarded contemplation. I can know everything about you. There's nothing in your life that is hidden from my sight. I know it all. That's why the psalmist says, search me, O God, and know me. Try me and see if there's any wicked way in me. O God, cleanse me. God knows you. He can know you in this sustained Focus, contemplative, and favorable sense. You can have His undivided attention. Now, when I'm going through a trial or a crisis, I like knowing that my Father is looking at me. Now, I know He's looking at you too, but I want Him looking at me. I'll never forget a child was trying to get his daddy's attention. Finally, he crawled up in his dad's lap and he put his hands on his daddy's cheek so his daddy would look at him. Well, I'd like to know that I can put my hands on the Father's cheeks and I've got His undivided attention. Now, you may not need that promise today, but the day will come in an unexpected turn of your life where that promise will be one of the greatest, most nourishing and refreshing 
promises from God in your life. Okay? We said that every promise has a condition. So we need to look at the conditions. And there are three conditions to this promise. All right? Notice the promise. This is the one to whom I will give my focused, affectionate attention. First of all, to him who is humble. To him who is humble. The New King James translates that poor. And then they'll translate in the, the Sermon on the Mount, in the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit. The word probably should be humble. It's just a better, more descriptive word to our generation. By the way, in the book of Numbers, the Bible says Moses was humble. In Matthew 11, Jesus says, I am humble and lowly of heart. To be humble was a virtue of godliness in the Old Testament and in the New. It may be despised today, but in the eyes of God, it is highly esteemed. You want God's focused attention? Then he's looking at those who are humble. Well, what does it mean to be humble? It means to be bowed down in submission, to be bowed down in distress or in need. So to put it in a word or two, to be humble and to have God's undivided attention means that we are in submission and living in dependency upon him. OK, now, what does it mean to live in submission? It means, you know, who the boss is. Lord, I'm the servant. You're the master. I'm content to be the servant, but I want you to be the master. Now, because Jesus is a gentleman king, anytime I want to reassert my will and sit on the throne of my heart, he'll allow me to do that. That, by definition, would be sin on my part, but he's a gentleman. He won't force his way upon that throne. I have to choose many times every day. But folks, when we realize we've sinned, going back to last Sunday, we confess that sin and we surrender our heart afresh to Jesus, we're displaying that we are humble people. Jesus is Lord. The humble person wants Jesus to be Lord and every area of his or her life in submission to Jesus' Lordship. And also that person who's under the Lordship of Christ is willing to live and walk in total dependency upon Jesus. Now, I see this in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 and 7. You might just jot that down in, the, in your notes, but here's what Peter says. He says, humble yourselves under the hand of God. Is that submission? Yeah. And he will exalt you in due time. Then he says, casting all of your cares on him because he cares for you. That's Isaiah 2. Humble. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. That's submission. Then casting all of your cares on him. Is God big enough who rules the universe? Who has made earth that speck of sand, his footstool? Is he big enough, great enough to be concerned about every one of your cares? Yes. And if you are a humble one, he has given you his undivided attention. He's concerned about every concern. There's a scripture in the Old Testament that says he has stored each of your tears in a bottle. Well, I tell you, that's focused attention. You don't shed a tear. He doesn't know about it. You don't lose a hair. He doesn't know about either because he's keeping up with that, too. Now, folks, like it or not, God's gaze knows all. But you only have the assurance of this persistent, focused contemplation that is affectionate and that esteems you greatly if you're a humble person. That's what the Bible says. This is the one to whom I will look, to the one who is humble. So let me ask you a question. Are you humble? Well, you say, I'm too humble to answer that question. Um, well, would other people say you're humble? Well, now, what do you mean? By, well, I mean, I'm not saying that, that 
that somebody, others would say that folks walk all over you, that you don't have a will, that you're just sort of milk toast and tread on me. Yeah, come hit me. Come hit me. Yeah, slap me. That's okay. I'm, I'm real humble. No, 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 no. We're not. Moses was humble. Jesus was humble. They were not milk toast, spaghetti spine people. They were men of conviction. They were leaders. But let me ask you this. If somebody were to come up to you and say, is this individual over here, are they submitted to the Lordship of Christ? And you happen to be the person that they were pointing to? What would they say about you? What would your family say about you? Are you submitted to Christ's Lordship? Are you wanting more and more of your life to be under His Lordship? See, that's a humble heart. And what about this thing of living in dependency upon the Lord? Um, would people say that you trust the Lord in your daily life? I mean, do they ever remember a time when you said, you know, why don't we pray about that before we just launch out and do something or before we make our decision? Let's pray about it and acknowledge the Lord in this. Or have they ever heard you say, you know, we need to trust the Lord for that? Do they see you being a person of faith who is living in a dependent relationship upon Jesus? I cannot answer that question for you, but would they say that about you? Because if they say, you know, I think he is, I really believe that's true of her, then you've passed the first test. And if you don't pass the first test, today is the beginning of the rest of your life. Say, Lord, by your grace and in your loving mercy, please teach me to be submissive to you and to walk in dependency upon you. Whatever you want to call that attribute, it's a virtue of the godly called humility. All right. So second is this is the one to whom I will look to him who is humble. And secondly, to him who is contrite of spirit, contrite of spirit. The word contrite there means to smite, to smite. It's not a very pleasant word. And to be contrite of spirit means that your spirit is grieved over sin in your life. You are grieved over sin in your life and you want to deal with it. No person who is humble, submitted to Christ and walking in dependency upon him who is who is grieved over sin in, in his or her life is going to fail to deal with that. Because they want Christ's lordship to be extended over that area of failure or sin in his or her life. So they want Christ to be Lord over that. They want him to deal with it. So they are grieved over sin in their lives. Well, before I go to that, one, let me ask a few questions. Does sin bother you? Are you content to uh, watch porn on the Internet? Are you content to use God's name in vain? Maybe it bothers you a little bit, but the very next day you're back using his name in vain again. Um, you gossip, but it doesn't really bother you too much. It used to bother you more than it does now, but you don't mind passing along a tale that may or may not be true, but put somebody in a bad light. Gossip doesn't bother you anymore. What about worry? Does worry bother you? Oh, it's you don't know my life. You don't know my family. You don't know my work. The Bible says, be anxious for nothing, but in all things through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, make your request known to God. And the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard and garrison your heart. Worry is saying, God, you're really not in control over this area. Worry is saying, God, I don't know if you are big enough to handle this area. Worry is one of America's favorite pastimes. Has the Holy Spirit convicted you of that? And has it grieved your heart to the point that you are willing to deal with it? Because those who are contrite of spirit are what Jesus referred to, I believe, in the Sermon on the Mount as those who are poor in spirit. They know they're not perfect. They want to be more than they are. And they know that the things in their lives grieve and quench the Holy Spirit and it grieves their own spirit as well. And they want to deal with those things. So are you humble? Are you contrite of spirit? If you are, 
then you're two-thirds of the way to claiming this promise, this glorious promise of God's attentiveness. If you're not contrite of spirit, then I'll tell you what will help you to become more sensitive to sin in your life. And that is to get closer to Jesus. Not only will sin become more real, but His love and forgiveness will become more real. Another thing that will help you to become more sensitive to sin is to get into the Word of God. Get into the Word. If you're spending all your time watching television and recreating, doing this, that, and the other, and don't have time for God's Word and aren't cultivating a relationship with Jesus, that may be one of the reasons why you're not qualified to claim this promise. All right, third qualification, humble, contrite of spirit and tremble at my word. The word tremble means to be fearful, to be fearful. So why in the world would anybody be fearful of the word of God? What does it mean to tremble at God's word? Well, first of all, I think it means we respect the Bible. We respect it. Why do we respect the Bible? Because it claims to be the word of God. And if God is behind the Bible and we know there is no greater authority than He. We need to respect the Bible because we respect Him. So we tremble at His Word. We respect the Bible. Now, if you respect the Bible, you're going to want to study the Bible. I promise you. Uh, I remember a lady who put a Bible uh, on her coffee table and she says, I never put anything on top of the, the Holy Bible. Well, that's one way to respect the Bible, but is she reading the Bible? I would think God would much rather somebody make a lot of footnotes and highlights and underlinings in his word as a manual for daily living than to put it on a shelf and say the way I honor the word is not to let dust collect on it or to put anything on top of it. Folks, the word of God, man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds forth out of the mouth of God. To tremble at God's word means we respect it. When God speaks, we listen. When you come into a church service, when you go into a Sunday school class, when in your quiet time you open the Bible, do you say, Father, speak to me. Your servant heareth. To kind of quote Samuel in the Old Testament. Do you want to hear from God? Are you just a hearer or a doer of the word as well? Because obedience to the word is to tremble at the word. Folks, again, I'm not trying to to um, focus on the past, but our church made a decision regarding Boy Scouts because we tremble at God's word. The word of God is our standard. And I appreciate the fact that when the vote came in, 96% in favor, there was not one applaud, not one whoop. There was no jubilation in our church. It was a sad day for Cana and for Boy Scouts of America. We all understood that. It was a sad vote. But we felt that we have no choice. If we tremble at God's word, we want to consider what God says in his word. And as best we can understand his word, stand with his word. Now, other churches that make other decisions, they do not answer to me. OK, they answer to the to the Lord of the church. So I'm not going to stand in judgment on anybody else. I'm not responsible for them. But folks, do we tremble at his word? Young people, listen to me. We are the counterculture. The world says that sexual relations is nothing more than a more intimate kiss. It's not what God's Word says. God says it is for the marriage covenant. Don't listen to the lies of the world. Sin brings consequences. If God says no, it's because it is in our best interest not to become sexually active outside of or before marriage. It's in our best interest. But we're too senseless to understand. We don't understand God's heart. He cares for us. And those who tremble at His word will walk with him.
as best they know how. And then when we are less than perfect, and we always will be, we repent of our sin because it grieves our heart. And we submit to the Lordship of Christ and we appropriate God's relational forgiveness that we spoke of last week. So let me ask you a question. Do you tremble at God's word? I mean, I appreciate the fact somebody said it's not what I don't understand about the Bible that bothers me. It's what I do understand about it that bothers me. I mean, all of us know more than we do. I admit that. But do you tremble at God's word? If God says it, has that become your guide for your life? This is the one to whom I will look. To whom I will give my sustained, focused, caring, affectionate attention. To him who is humble, who is contrite of spirit, and who trembles at my word. I hope you can claim Isaiah 66 too today. But if you cannot, then today is the day of repentance. Make a change, whatever change. Ask God to show you what changes you need to make so that you can be this kind of person. That's where the abundant, victorious Christian life is. Really, this is where the fullness of the Spirit is. This is where the Christian life gets really exciting as an adventure. Let's pray together. If you're here this morning with our heads bowed, and you cannot claim this promise, not because you're... You don't meet the conditions, but because even more fundamentally than that, you are not a child of God. You do not have Jesus as your own Lord and Savior. That certainly is the beginning point. To be humble means to be submissive to Jesus as Lord. That deals with the salvation issue. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you don't know for sure and certain that if you died, you would go to heaven and be with Jesus forever. Then right where you are right now, I urge you in your own words to confess to God that you're a sinner. You've not kept his laws. You've lived in rebellion against him. And ask his forgiveness. In your own words. Because Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins. And in your own words. Ask Jesus to come into your heart and to assume his rightful place on the throne. You're willing to get off the throne. You're going to invite him to come and sit on the throne as Lord. You're submitting everything you know about yourself to everything you know about him right now. In your own words, ask him. Lord, I thank you that you hear the humble heart that honestly asks you for forgiveness and surrenders to Jesus as Lord and Savior. Father, hear those prayers. Hear the prayers of many who this day and in the days ahead will say, Father, I want to be humble, contrite of spirit. I want to tremble at your word. Help me, O God. Make me the man, the woman you've saved me to be. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Destry's leading us in a song of decision. If you need to profess your faith in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, as we stand in a moment, I want to encourage you to come forward and meet me down front. If God is leading you to move your membership to Cana to help us to become the church God's called us to be, we invite you to come and begin that process. Maybe you need to come and pray. That's fine, too. You come and pray. The altar's always open for prayer. Thank you for listening to today's message. The Word of God seeks to accomplish two objectives. First, to introduce people to God's love and forgiveness. And second, to assist people to discover the abundant and victorious Christian life. If you would like to experience God's love and forgiveness, may I encourage you to call our church today at 
area code 817-295-3891 and request to speak with Dr. Stewart or with one of our other caring ministers. They will answer any questions you might have and help you to receive God's wonderful gift of forgiveness and eternal life. You may also go to our church's webpage and click on the link entitled Finding Peace with God. You will find this link in the upper left hand corner of Cana's webpage. The church webpage is located at www.canachurch.com. This web address can also be found on the label of this CD. If you enjoyed this message, you may listen on the internet to other messages by our pastor. To do this, simply go to our church's webpage and click on the link entitled Audio Sermons. The Cana webpage has additional information about our staff, our ministries, and the times of our services. You may access our church calendar on the internet for a fuller listing of ministry opportunities. Cana is a loving, Bible-believing church family, and we would be honored to have you join us for worship at your earliest convenience. At Cana, you will always find a warm welcome. And now on behalf of our pastor and church family, may I say, we hope that God will bless you and give you a wonderful day.